Um, well, I thought what I thought would be good is to go over some real case studies. Um, and so I pulled up one that I stole from the rehab course that I had in there. Uh, Kim, you might, you might remember this person, but the idea was to differentiate between shoulder and neck. How do you know when someone has a neck injury versus a shoulder injury? Because those can be really confusing and hard to figure out. So I thought I would pose you um, at least one case study that we could take off from and talk about cues, clues, thoughts, um, so that you could actually feel more confident or ask questions that are relevant to help steer you into understanding whether you're, you should worry about somebody's neck or whether you should worry about their shoulder without, you know, not trying to diagnose anything, but just trying to understand maybe what you want to do to protect that person in a Pilates setting. So does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. So this, I'll read off the case. I can share my screen. Is it easier for you to see it on the screen? I can share the screen and show you. All right, so this is the one that I wanted to talk about. It's a 65-year-old active cyclist who comes in complaining of severe cervical spine pain that's going up the neck towards the head and down over the top of his shoulder. He feels he can still ride his bike, but is not able to sleep at night without significant pain and has a lot of pain trying to reach behind his back and lift his arm up in front of his body and slightly out to the side. So I know it's not a lot of information, but I, you probably, you, there's enough, there's not a lot of information, but it's enough information for you to start to tease out a few things. So, you know, I always think it's super important to understand, to hear what your client is saying, right? So, and to think about what this person might look like. So what might, let's start there. What might a 65 year old active cyclist look like? Um, do you think? Stooped over shoulder, shoulders forward, rounded. Rounded shoulders. Forward head, be. forward head, maybe a little bit. Forward head, mm hmm Yep. And so I'll give you another piece of information so, okay. that he does work at a computer most of the day. Okay, so that would that would follow your theory, Lisa, of being forward, a little rounded shoulders, a little forward head. Yeah, and cycling has that forward shoulder rounded position, but what else does cycling have that's not great? Maybe the cycling. Uh, yeah, the head placement, because you have to look at the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that bump of the lordotic, yeah, the, the lord, does he have that, the lordotic, hypotic, lordotic, right? Well, I call it flip top head a little bit. So what happens, especially with the road cyclists and um, more with the road cyclists because they go into the drops or get lower, they're a little bit more low with the torso than, um, than a cyclist on a mountain bike is usually a little bit more upright. So it is more with a road cyclist, but the head, you have to look at the road. And as you get tired, the shoulders come up a little and then you get the little turtle head and then you could still look up at the road. So you end up in cervical extension a lot of the time, which can be really not a great posture, especially, unfortunately, especially as we age, we tend to get a little bit stenotic in the neck, meaning we get our spaces for the spinal cord and everything to exit are smaller. Uh, so there's not as much wiggle room if your head has to go into extension, yeah? So, uh, so, okay, we're worried about posture for sure. We're worried about head posture and shoulder posture though. So if we were trying to differentiate if this is head or shoulder, that doesn't help. That information so far hasn't helped us very much to differentiate one from the other, yeah? So, and then he says he has severe cervical spine pain that's going up the neck toward the head and down over the top of his shoulder. So down over the top in front of the shoulder. Oh, I started the wrong meeting, Tits is saying. Mm -hmm. This is the rehab course meeting and not the rounds meeting. Oh, yes. 
I did do something wrong. <laughs> okay, so is there anybody in the other meeting? Oh, shoot. Uh, they may be, but... Okay, do you guys I mind can... flipping, flipping over to the other meeting? Okay, sorry. Let, do you have the link for the other meeting? I'll just put it in the chat right now, I think. It's oh, here. I can't Hold on. I mean, it's right here. Can you just put it in the chat? No, no, this is the, this one. Hold on, this is this one. No, no, don't do that. It's the, uh, let's see. Oh, I messed it up and somebody's going to be over there. <laughs> uh, I'm going to post it right now. It's on Facebook, but I'm going to post it right now. This one, the second one. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go over there. I'll see you guys in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a loser. Oh my gosh. I hope it's already late. Somebody might have signed in and then disappeared. Um, yeah, I was trying to hop on. Um, I was driving and I was trying to put it on my phone and I was like, oh, maybe it's just like a weird connection and I'm not getting through. <laughs> and then Kim texted me and she was like, I can't get into that. I know. Oh, you guys should just kick me in the butt sometimes. <laughs> it's still the best of uh, us. Oh. I feel sad for anybody who tried to get in that we don't know. At least you guys, you guys give me a little <laughs> leeway. <laughs> you forgive yeah. me. <laughs> oh, so you're, sorry. When I, I texted your 302, your, your California number first, and you don't uh, get that, right? You don't. You, sometimes doesn't, sometimes doesn't. So I need to um, figure out why that happens. At least I can't yeah. get in now. Okay, I'll send her that. Um, sometimes it comes right through and sometimes it doesn't. That's so odd. It should be. So I had I your know. Swiss number from yeah. our text exchange the other day. Okay. okay, I should add that to my phone book. I'll do that right now. Yes, add that to your phone book. Oh, now I see it. Are you hosting the rounds today? It says there's another meeting in progress. Um, so maybe I just didn't see it the first time, or maybe it came in with your other. So it does come here. Oh no, sorry. Sorry, my bad. Just next time say, hey, you screwed up. <laughs> um, okay, anyway, Genevieve, I don't know how much you heard about the case study. Did you hear the case study? Okay, so I'll just read it to you again. Um, it's a 65 year old active cyclist comes in complaining of severe cervical spine pain that's going up the neck toward the head and down over the top of the shoulder. Maybe I'll just share, can I wonder if I can share this screen? Uh, sorry, let me just share the screen start. And you can see yourselves again, but you can also see the, um, okay, can you see that now, the um, case study? So um, he feels he can still ride his bike, but is not able to sleep at night without significant pain and has a lot of pain trying to reach behind his back and lift up his arms <sighs> and his body and slightly out to the side. So the, the goal was to kind of figure out, to be able to start differentiating between the, the source of the pain um, and so where the pain is and understanding what we need to be careful of because you it's a little bit hard to differentiate <coughs> cervical spine a lot from shoulder a lot of the time. So, um, so we said that the posture could be an issue. So um, shoulders forward was one of the things to be concerned about. The other would be head positioning would be something to be concerned about. So there are, these are the questions I usually ask are um, here. So what are your concerns about the person or problem list? So we'd be concerned about the posture. We'd be concerned about what else? I'd be um, thinking it was a shoulder problem 
if he couldn't lift his arm up without pain, okay. more good. of a shoulder than a neck. Okay, so you you keyed right in, Kim. So well done. Um, so yes, this is this is one of the biggest factors that really can help us differentiate where the source of the pain is. So, and that is exactly what Kim said. He can't. He's having a lot of pain trying to reach behind his back and lift his arm up in front of his body and slightly out to the side. So if motion, if you can figure out what motion is bothering the person, a lot of times that will help you determine where the source of the pain is. And so you have, that's, a, that's exactly the kind of clues that you wanna zone in on. So this in this case, I would say, yeah, this is, um, this sounds like moving the arm is definitely affecting what's going on now. And the other clue in this, if he said, it hurts me to lift my arm overhead. And that was the only thing he said, right? It hurts me to lift my arm up like this. That's when it hurts. That doesn't give you a lot of information about whether it's neck or shoulder, right? Because Somebody with a hurting neck lifting the arm up, the arm is super heavy. If all of this is in spasm or if that first rib is elevated up, saying that lifting that arm up overhead hurts, hurts me more um, doesn't quite give you enough information. But here we have two, three motions. We have reach behind the back. That's classic shoulder pain, right? Usually that's a, always a good one to ask. It does it hurt if you reach behind your back or reach either like trying to undo a bra strap or scratch your back in the back or reaching in the back seat of a car. Those are good ones to ask because if the, that hurts, um, that really the neck doesn't get a lot involved in those emotions, but the shoulder is super involved in those motions. So the hand behind the back uh, or reaching behind you is a good one to ask if you're considering that it could be shoulder. The confusing thing about this client when he came in is that if I, he came in, his complaint was neck pain, always neck pain. It wasn't shoulder pain. And my shoulder is okay. My neck really hurts. And the reason in this case is because he had such a, developed such an interesting compensation pattern that he had pulled the whole rib cage up, right? So that first rib is right up here. And he had pulled this up so much that he had kind of, subluxed a little bit that first rib. He did that in protection of his shoulder without even realizing that that's what he was doing. And that first rib subluxation is super painful. Like it can take your breath away because imagine, right? It's rib cage. You, you can't expand and contract your rib cage um, as well. So, it, and when you take a deep breath, it goes up and moves that rib more out of position. So it can be breathtaking. So we actually spent a little bit of time working on his neck and I kept saying, oh, this is, he would feel better, somewhat better, but then he'd have the pain again. And then he'd feel somewhat better and then he'd have the pain again. So we didn't get anywhere. And then we started investigating more his shoulder and we went back and forth between shoulder and neck because he did have quite a lot of motion at his shoulder still. But then we started being able to pinpoint that there were a few motions that were definitely uh, bothering his arm and shoulder. And finally sent him off to a doctor to have an MRI. And the doctor confirmed that it was shoulder and then gave him a cortisone shot in the shoulder. And he got a lot better very quickly. So, um, and then everything in the neck calmed down. So I think um, it was just really valuable to, it's really valuable to figure out how, what questions can I ask? for somebody so that I can differentiate because your, your session with the person is going to be quite different if you think they have a neck issue than if you think they have a shoulder issue, don't you think? I'm thinking because as a Pilates instructor, neck and shoulders, well, shoulders we'd be more careful about certain things that we do but we you know I'm always going for the engaging the upper back you know the rowing series that that kind of stuff um mm -hmm. 
whether it's neck or shoulder, just to try to get the that release mm -hmm. in the neck and shoulder. I mean, I don't know about mm -hmm. quite different, but definitely you do some different things. Yeah, well, if it's shoulder versus neck, right, you could still do upper ab curls. If it's True. Not yeah, yeah, neck, yeah. Okay. Right. Thinking through it. So, yeah. yeah. So you could still do, if it's not the neck, you could still do upper ab curls. And um, yeah. you'd have to watch for arm positioning, right? So this position behind that might be painful, mm -hmm. but the actual, the actual upper ab curl would not. Um, right. You would be, if you were working on neck, you would do a lot of quadruped where right. quadrupeds are planking it shoulder. Yes. Eventually that would be good. But if the shoulder was really acute, Not you wouldn't right want to do yeah. it right away. Exactly. And then you would do, if you thought, if I thought it was neck, I would do a lot more, a shoulder opening thoracic, I mean, thoracic spine opening for both. Yes, I agree. But I would, wouldn't be as careful about if I think it's neck, I wouldn't be as careful about where the arms go. Whereas mm -hmm. if I think it's shoulder, I'm going to be really careful where the, yeah. right, where the arms are going. So it's helpful to try and tease that out. You're not always going to be able to tease it out. And if the first rib is really involved, like in this case, you have to be careful of both things anyway, right? Uh, because, because that is a real problem in and of itself. It's just that it wasn't solving the problem. Fixing that was not solving the problem because the problem was a rotator cuff issue and that was what triggered everything else so it was like at first I was treating the symptom and not getting to what was actually the cause of it all mm -hmm. until he had that injection everything calmed down we were able to strengthen a lot strengthen the shoulder a lot um, and then go back to strengthening on all fours and he was one of those clients that popped in every time he was injured for a period of time. And then I don't hear from him and I know all as well until I hear from him again. Then I know there's another <laughs> problem. So, you know, that was, he's mm -hmm. one of those. But, um, I was going to say he had more than that. He's had, he had a lot of other problems oh, before that. We were, we, yeah. Oh yes. We went through a whole <laughs> gamut. We did. Yes. With yeah. him. So, um, but I, I haven't heard from him in a long time. So that's good news. I think <laughs> none so. of us have heard from him. So that means it's all good. Um, yeah, but, uh, does that, is that helpful to think that way to go through thinking that way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think things to watch out for. So just to review a little bit, um, the other piece of information in this is that it hurts to reach behind his back. So that's internal rotation of the shoulder. Um, and then it hurts to bring his arm up in that flexion adduction, flexion, excuse me, abduction positioning, right? So where does that lead you to think? If you were gonna, if I was gonna pick your brains a little bit, and it's okay if you don't know, but if I'm gonna pick your brain a little bit more, what do you start thinking about when you think of those two motions? Supraspinatus. I, I definitely start thinking of supraspinatus. Right. Right. That's it's the that. One, that's the one more on top, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so supraspinatus. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah. I, if you think back, just quick, this will be good for you, Lisa, for a quick a little anatomy review, right? If you you can even palpate right. because they're all thin, thin enough. You, the scapula itself, right, right at the scapula, at the top of the scapula, there's the spine of the scapula, right? You can, if you poke mm -hmm. in a bit, you'll feel it. Above that, the meaty stuff above it, that's your supraspinatus. And it comes out here towards the anterior shoulder here. Yeah, so supraspinatus is right in mm -hmm. there. The other rotator cuff muscles are right below the spine. Infraspinatus down below and teres minor a little bit below. They're gonna insert posterior shoulder, right? So the, an infraspinatus right along the spine of the scapula just below it supraspinatus just above the spine of the scapula and teres minor a little lower than infraspinatus. Okay. And the teres minor fibers and the infraspinatus fibers kind of mix. So it's really difficult to tease out which is which by palpation. Although, ooh, am I sore back there? Um, most people are a little bit sore at the rotator cuff uh, tendons anyway. So if you poke at supraspinatus, you can dig in there um, right at the 
top of the shoulder, there's two little bump, bony bumps and right between it is that supraspinatus and right in front of it is the biceps tendon. So, and you can kind of feel where it is and it's mm -hmm. usually a little tender anyway. Oh. So I can get to that little tender spot where it's coming through. Like right here, tender. Yeah, hmm. yep. And then remember subscapularis is this side of my shoulder blade. Right. If I wanna get in there, I'm gonna mm -hmm. get into subscapularis this way. So um, the interesting thing about hand behind the back, right? So supraspinatus function wise is flexion abduction, right? Mm -hmm. When we go into internal rotation, why does that? Internal rotation is which which rotator cuff muscle? You know this. Yeah. Subscapularis. Subscapularis. Yeah, subscapularis is the internal rotator, right? So I always tell you, just memorize that one and you know what the others do because they it's the only one. Right? Subscapularis. So subscapularis yeah. internally rotates. But why does it hurt to bring my hand behind the back if it also hurts to, to flexion abduct? What happens in this position to supraspinatus? Okay. It's a little compressed, I think. It can get compressed, impinged a little in the front. Yeah. It also yeah. gets pulled, it gets pulled mm. on stretch. Right. So, and, and it can get that impingement happens in the front of the shoulder with the biceps and or supraspinatus. So if somebody has had a history of sort of friction at the front of the shoulder, they might have a little bone spurring in there too, or a little uneven, less than smooth bony surface. And that can make it really difficult to go into internal rotation without hurting. Plus supraspinatus mm -hmm. is getting a little bit on stretch. If you think about where it's coming from and then to the front of the shoulder, so if it's sore, it's not gonna like going behind back, right? So with these two things in his, in the information that you are given up in that angle and then behind the back, those are really good indicators that this might be shoulder and not neck versus mm -hmm. a straight up flexion or reaching overhead to grab something or um, shrugging my shoulder or carrying a bag on the shoulder, all of that is really hard to differentiate if it's um, a neck versus a shoulder, right? Whereas those two motions, this one and this one can really help you differentiate shoulder from neck. Do you think um, neck is gonna predispose people more for, to headaches than shoulder? Yeah, so there is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there is a very big, there's a lot of research on the cervicogenic, we call it cervicogenic headaches, which you probably know a lot about. But yeah. um, that is, a, yeah, that is a headache that's um, specifically because of an issue at the neck, an orthopedic issue at the neck, I should say. Yeah, it, so they're, they're named cervicogenic headaches. And they can be... Uh, you know, I'd have to look and see, but I, my, they can be really anywhere in the head, but usually starting from the back of the skull and going somewhere in relationship to the, the pain. Um, so those, but those are definitely a thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And shoulders would not predispose to headaches so much. Right. Shouldn't, right? Not if it's just a pure shoulder injury. The other piece of information that could be helpful is if there is um, an arc of motion at the shoulder, meaning if I go through a range of motion at the shoulder, so if, I, if I'm fine, 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 ooh, and then I go here and then, oh, I'm fine again. That is very shoulder-ish. That could be labrum. That could be bursitis, mm -hmm. right? So if there's if there's a catch and a moment of and then pain for a short while and then they can finish that motion, that's more like without pain. That's more likely shoulder than it would be neck as well, right? So mm -hmm. that that was another way to differentiate the two. Yeah. 
Great. Um, trying to think if there's another, do you guys have any questions about that or any other, can you think of any case studies that might be um, more or similar or that you might have questions about? Um, I just, for, um, I have my, one of my friends that I've been training for a long time, working with for a long time, and even used to come into the studio quite a bit, um, had a torn rotator cuff. And he wouldn't, uh, he didn't have surgery. He didn't have a shot. He just over time, I guess, probably years, a few years at least, um, it healed itself, I guess. Yeah. So I guess how long does that usually take? Yeah, I mean, it depends really on the severity of the tearing. So it'd be hard to give an answer. Um, I think uh, the severity of the tearing and the impact that it has on daily life. So for example, if it's a partial tear, then usually a surgical approach is not the best thing because unless they're really that it's about to fray. So if you imagine again, the tendons will tear, they'll fray, right? So it's like you have frayed hairs and some of those often are still holding on, which is great. And those can heal because we can, it's a muscle, right? It's a muscle tendon. So hopefully the idea is that if we hypertrophy, we build up that muscle. We also build up the tendon and it, it hangs on with those two threads that actually start building into bigger threads. It's not that the threads that break reattach, right? I don't think that happens so much, but we, that we end up with remodeling, fascial remodeling, tendinous remodeling over time. So we get stronger again over time. It, that takes a long time. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and if it's a something that can be not re-aggravated all the time, it, it should do a good job healing. It's yeah. when, when all the fibers are detached and there's no more connection to the rotator cuff that it's really difficult to heal because you remember the function of those rotator cuff muscles, one of the main functions is to hold on to that humerus, right? And keep it against the glenoid nice and secure so that we have good joint mechanics. So if you start losing those rotator cuff muscles or tendons or attachments, the humerus is not in its ideal position anymore. Mm -hmm. So unless we can really beef up those other rotator cuff muscles, we're gonna have less than ideal mechanical motion at the humerus, the glenohumeral joint. So if that's the case, then it's going to take even longer for somebody to heal because that, um, you know, the, the joint isn't functioning. It's not a, a smooth running engine anymore. It's maybe grinding or rubbing or pulling or on the, those tendons some. Uh, so that would be harder to heal. But yeah, if you can't. A few years. I would say it was a few years that we just kept working on rowing and, you know, just a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Anyway. Internal external rotation exercises are ideal um, because that's targeting exactly the rotator cuff muscles. Mm -hmm. Adding biceps in can be super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, those are all the really great exercises to add in to really try and strengthen. And then approximation of the shoulder exercise like on all fours could be really good with the, just the right amount of weight. If I would say holding planks, but not push-ups. Push-ups are really good at tearing rotator cuffs because it's really hard to hold that form with all the weight. So, but the others like all fours, half planks or planking, full planking, holding is usually pretty good. So those were the, those would be the things that I would work towards and then see if they're not in so much pain. So the, the other thing that's interesting here um, is that rotator cuff pain, this is to sleep, he, this one says he can't sleep at night without significant pain. Rotator cuff pain hurts a lot and it hurts at night. That mm. pain hurts at night and so does nerve impingement it hurts at night. That's when yeah. if you have a cervical nerve impingement that's going to get you at night and keep you up at night. But rotator cuff pain will also keep you up at night. So mm -hmm. 
those that information doesn't help you that he's up at night to know which is which. But but if it's a fully torn rotator cuff, they're going to have a hard time sleeping at night. So if it's um, if it's less than that, strengthening is fantastic, and it does take does take time though, especially because you can't fully rest it, right? And you can't get off of it entirely. And actually, we don't right. recommend not moving the shoulder because we worry about things like adhesive capsulitis, right? Or frozen shoulder after the fact. So, but getting it mechanically sound is ideal. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, you know, what's interesting and I don't know the answer to this and maybe I should look it up, but when people have a bicep tendon tear, they sometimes don't repair it, right? Depending on the person. So, mm -hmm. and that's even with a full detachment. And so, but my clients who have, have that don't seem to be in a huge amount of pain after that. And I'm not sure if that was because they were in pain initially and that went away, or if it just wasn't that painful. One of my clients was in his eighties when he did it and he actually didn't even have that much pain. So, um, it's an interesting thing. Whereas if you tear completely tear your rotator cuff, that's really painful. So I don't know why, but that might be something worth looking up in all your free time <laughs> is why does a biceps rupture hurt less than a rotator cuff rupture tear? Hey, I should look that up. That would be <laughs> good information. Maybe I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> all right. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day, you guys.